Now I can't take myself serious anymore. It's gonna be hard. The first one's gonna be the best one. I was so serious. It was so, it was so authentic. Oh my God. All right, I gotta get myself together because I'm still laughing at that shit. My name's LA Dub Z. I'm a dope ass rapper from Northeast Ohio. Can't you didn't know. Yeah, it's LA Dub Z and I'm hella dope. And place to detect you too, couldn't see it with the telescope. And to hang me out to dry, you gon' need hella rope can print I'm whipping you niggas, no coup to kinde. All swagged out right here. They wish they could do it like this. You know what I'm saying? Around the the flu. I got nuts, I got folks. If you really wanna screw it, who's that you get? Used to be a no name, everybody tried to chalk me. Now I'm well known, just like No, I'm not lyrical, I am lyric kill, cause I kill everything that my lips choose to spill. Exclusive. Yeah, the endless nigga on the fame. Pictures next to mine, I'm scared I blow them out the frame. Damn it, I might do it just for the love of this music. So much fire on my hard drive. Computers cannot compute it. A young disciple like Lucas, be blessed with me. Before I got into music, I thought I was gonna be like a scientist. I, I remember a scientist being the first aspiration I ever had. Like, yeah, watching like Bill Nye the Science Guy and shit, thinking I was gonna like concoct a bunch of explosive whatever chemicals I could put together and blow shit up, cause you know, that just seemed cool. And then once I got older and realized that, you know, science has a lot of math to it, fuck math. I started getting into art, you know, I started drawing a lot of shit, painting a lot of shit, you know, bothering my mom every day to do like arts and crafts and stuff like that. And uh, cause my mom's a seamstress, so she always had like tons of just fabric and pipe cleaners and all types of, you know, little kids arts and craft type shit. So that's when I really started getting creative. And then first time I ever really got into actually doing music for myself, my older cousins, and my sister were gonna do this record. And it was the first time anybody in my life that I knew personally was going to record uh, something, especially being hip hop. And you know, I had been you know a hip hop lover for almost as long as I can remember. But the fact that they were doing it made it real to me. It was like, oh, I can do this. Before, you know, before it was just something that was out there in the world that people did that was cool. But to see, you know, somebody out of my family attempting it and, you know, being able to do it on their own made it real to me, which was, you know, around 12. 12 years old is when I wrote my first bar. That's, you know, when I started experimenting with the music itself and took about a year and a half for me to be like, fuck yeah, this is what I want to do with my life. The most important thing that I can give to my fans, if nothing else, is just the confidence to be yourself, the individual that is you, and on top of that, to go deeper into the rabbit hole to discover who that is. Rather you haven't found yourself yet, rather you feel like you're being peer pressured by other people to be somebody who doesn't quite feel like you, find who that person is. And if you have found that person, make sure that person is completely uncaged. You know, I've gotten to the point in my life where I love pissing people off and I love making people happy. And what I mean by that is those are the two reactions that I get consistently. Either I made somebody upset or, you know, I rubbed somebody the wrong way or I made somebody laugh. I made somebody feel better about themselves. I made somebody's day, you know what I mean? I, I made them believe in themselves. I made them believe in humankind for another three seconds before they meet the next disappointment in their life. That's really all I want to give to people. You know, I have my own opinions about religion and politics and spirituality and life purpose and hip hop as a culture, as a music, and all these other things that I discuss in my music. But really, I'm saying all of that from in here because I just want the person hearing it to hear that transparency. Not just in the lyrics, but you know, like I want you to hear it in my voice and in, in my vibration when I speak to you that this guy is not bullshitting. And if I am, you know, it's a joke on purpose, but you're gonna, you're gonna feel that transparency with me as an artist. You know, I'm not trying to sell you something. If, if I am, it's just me, it's just who I am. You know what I mean? And I feel like you can relate to me regardless of who you are if I just be myself. So that's, that's really what I wanna get out in my music. Fuck how everybody else feels about you. How do you feel about you? If it's not comfortable, get comfortable with it. And then, you know, evolve from, from that.
Yeah. yeah, without being too digs, which is, you know, one of my fellow artists, something he says about himself, I'm too digs for this shit. Um, <laughs> I feel like I have found a balance between being the most humble person you'll ever meet and on the other side, being the most arrogant asshole you can come across. Like, I feel like I've found like a centerpiece in between the two of those and I'm becoming comfortable with it. You know, there was definitely a point in my life where I was letting way too many people either just walk all over me or make decisions that were rightfully mine. Rather, it was because I was too afraid to speak up and actually say, hey, this is how I feel about it. Or, you know, I just didn't feel entitled to my own being, so to speak. But, you know, it took several life experiences for me to kind of wake up and be like, I am this person inside of this vessel. And, you know, this soul in here knows what it's doing and knows what it's connected to. And, you know, your opinion is nice and all. I'm going to listen. I'm going to take my time. And, you know, I'm going to consider it. But at the end of the day, the choices I make are mine. And you can feel however the fuck you want to feel about it. But I'm going to go ahead about it. So um, I feel like, you know, that's the best thing that I have to offer, like I was saying before. Because... I love to see that same thing about other people. The type of people I like to hang out with, you know, that I like to spend my time with, share my time with, are the people who know who they are, and if they don't yet, they're looking for that person. I feel like, you know, if I run into somebody who has a front, so to speak, like, it might have been Chris Rock, don't kill me if it wasn't, but, um... I think Chris Rock said at one point, when you, when you first meet somebody, he was talking about dating, but he said, when you first meet somebody, you're not meeting the real them, you're meeting the representative. And um, that's how I feel about life, you know? Like, I feel like the first time you meet somebody, everybody wants to make a good first impression, you know? People want to be accepted, people want other people to be comfortable with them. And I feel like a lot of people are so afraid of rejection that they rather put a front up of what they think you want them to be in order to be accepted instead of truly finding who you are and letting the people who relate to that person gravitate to you. And that's, you know, that's what I'm about. That's what my music is about. That's what I consider a quality of me. There's nowhere you can put me on this globe where I'm not going to be able to relate to a person within, you know, a mile radius of me. I can relate to everybody. And the only thing that's gonna stop me from doing that is that I can't speak your language. Unfortunately, I failed both of my language classes. French and Spanish, fucked them both up. But I'm pretty damn good with English. So if you happen to speak that, we can probably have a conversation and I can meet you halfway if we don't agree on something. That's me. Music is the best feeling in the world, period. Um, it's better than sex. It's better than getting high. It makes getting high better. But music, creating music, let me put it that way, creating music is absolute freedom. I don't know if that's cliche or not, but I don't, it is. It, it seriously is, like, because there's no rules to creating music. There's no rule to creating, period. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about being fruitful. You're kind of just growing whatever the fuck you want to grow. You want to grow a pear, grow a pear. You want to grow a watermelon, grow a watermelon. You want to grow a pear melon, grow a pear melon. Like, what the fuck is that? I don't know. Create it. That's the beautiful thing about it. Like, you can literally do whatever you want with it. And once you, you know, take off those chains that the music industry has given you that says, hey, you have to fit into this box or that box or, you know, Fuck that, you know what I mean? Like, do what you wanna do, even if no one agrees with it. You'll probably become pretty popular just because people hate the side of you. Like, so you know what I mean? Don't be afraid to do what you wanna do with music. And you know, I feel like that's the most exciting thing about, you know, uh, my musical process right now. You know, I feel like I truly found me within the last few years of my life. And now that I truly found me, I can take my music places that I never got to take it before. Because even though I was always trying to implement that message of just be yourself, 
You know, even if you go into some of my earliest recordings, I was preaching that shit. But it was like, now, you know, now that I know who I am, I can I can give more substance to that message. And, you know, music is the place where I can do that best. Like, there's no rules. I don't have to show up and, you know, have a uniform on. I don't have to clock in at a certain time. I don't have a, it's it's not a job. It's 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 a lifestyle. Creating period is a lifestyle. You do it when you feel like it, when the vibe is right, you do it how you want to do it. You finish when you decide you I mean it's it's freedom. And seriously, it's the only thing that costs is equipment and you know you can even be like, fuck that if you really want to. Go outside and bang on some trash cans in the middle of your fucking downtown. Like, you know what I mean? Music, vibration, it's free. And people can't charge you for it. It's fucking dope. Became popular or it became a fad, I lost interest in it. Like, it took the fun out of it. Like, oh, everybody's doing it now. And not just because everybody's doing it, but because this many people are doing it without a reason for doing it, besides that the next guy's doing it. And hooks, like I said, getting stuck in your head, that repetition, seeing it over and over again, hearing it over and over again, uh, to me kind of resembles like that zombified, robotic part of our culture as Americans. I'm going to do what the next person's doing. Why? Because the next person's doing it. Why? Because. I, I, I just hate that idea. So, like, like it, it, it literally makes me sick. I'm getting a stomach ache just talking about it. So, when I spit 32 bars straight and I give you no hook, that's why. Because, you know, it's not that I can't write hooks. I can write hooks. I've given you hooks before, you know what I mean? You go through my music, I've, I've got some tracks with some, some dope hooks, choruses, but you know, sometimes I'll hear a beat and I'll rap right over the hook slot, like, with no remorse, like, I don't give a fuck, because I had that much to say. It's really, when I get in my zone, I can't stop going. 16 bars, a, a lot of time, is just not enough for me. You know, when I first started writing, um, I remember a 16 bar verse could take me anywhere from four hours to to two or more days to write a whole verse. Now I can write a verse that I am proud of and I feel like I didn't bullshit on in like literally 15, 20 minutes just because I have so much to say. And you know, my art form, my actual craft, what I do, I've done it so much, I've practiced it so much you know, I've, I've, I've sharpened the sword that is my sword to hold. Everything that is in the context of my life. Because when I get behind the mic, I'm trying to give you bits and pieces of my story. And I feel like, you know, to understand me and for me to have the best chance of relating to as many different people as possible, that I have to tell all the different pieces of my life. Not just focus on one area that I feel like fits inside the realm of hip hop. Like, nah, fuck that. Like, what I try to do is bring in as many pieces of my life that most likely are not discussed by other rappers or other rappers that you have heard of or other rappers that are popular or other artists, period, you know, and just bring them into the realm of hip hop and make them belong there without it being awkward. There's something that's not genuine about it if you can't make it belong to hip hop, like actually belong to the music. Let me put it like this, okay? If I go outside and live my life today, right? And I have something happen to me, okay, let's say I go into the store and I see a pair of some pink pants and they're dope to me, right? I, I, I'll come back to my studio, you'll see it eventually, and, um, and I'll rap about that pink pair of pants with no fear, no hesitation, not giving a fuck, right? I never wore pink pants, I'm just saying. Um, but I'm going to do it in a way that's so genuine that 
it's going to feel like it belongs, not that I forced it. And so when I allow things to influence how I write my music and how I deliver my music and, you know, what type of beats and, you know, um, I really, it's like my life is, is a filter for all the experiences that I have. And after all the experiences I have passed through me, passed through this filter that is me, what you get in my music on the other side is that. That's exactly what it is. I will bring you whatever I want to bring you in my music, um, but if I brought it to you, it was because I felt like it was important to talk about, not because it fit, like, oh, this is hip hop, let me talk about that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, hip hop is the most influential art form in the world. Um, I don't care what anybody tells you, especially right now. Tupac was the first artist to show me why I wanted to do this. Like for real, like why I wanted to do this. And um, that's because of his transparency. Like the, listening to the dude's music, you, you just knew he meant every word of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, damn, like this guy means this shit and he cares about something. You know what I mean? He's very passionate about something. I should probably listen to this guy. Like that's that's the vibe I got when listening to his shit. So it was just like, that's always what I wanted out of his his music to put in mind. I want when you hear me, I want you to be like, yo, this is coming from a legitimate place inside of him. He didn't just write this to entertain me. He didn't just say this to appease somebody. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of comedy to my shit, but it still comes from a genuine place that is me. But I say a lot of the things that I say because I mean them. Like, you know, I, I mean them. And I feel some type of way about them. And, you know, um, even if it's not like 100% like this is how I feel every day, there's definitely a moment of a day where I could or very well do feel like that. And this is how I feel like expressing myself about it at this particular point in time. You know, my fans, obviously, but then, you know, I have different levels of fans. I have my local fans, I have my fans on the internet. You know, when I, when I started rapping, there weren't a whole lot of people who took me serious. And that's okay, you know, a lot of people start out with a dream and, you know, 90% of the people around them are like, yeah, okay, you know what I mean? But some of the first people I can remember to show me any type of love off bat, like I didn't even have to prove shit to him, was uh, my homie Austin, who I used to call Steak Sauce, my homie uh, Jam Master J, or better known as Joe. Both of those guys recorded me before anybody else ever gave me a chance, before anybody else would take me serious enough to let me step into their recording booth or their studio for that matter. And then after that, you know, it picked up. You know, I did have a lot of people in high school that were kind of rooting for me, as well as people who were like, yeah, fucking right. Like, you're not gonna make it, give up now. Like, come on, you're not gonna be a rapper. You're not even a real black kid. You're not gonna make it, like, you know. But then, you know, the longer I kept at it, there used to be a little venue about a town or two over from me called Club 87, and it was a magical fucking place. Had a lot of good time there, and, uh, the guys who ran that place, one being David Novak, and Joe, as I mentioned earlier, was in a band called The Mistaken, which had a lot of my close homies in it. And through them, I, you know, I did like my first live performance. They're kind of how I got in touch with the venue, and you know, I started getting a little bit of local support. But after after that, like after graduating and you know, and moving, moving out of the original region that I grew up in. I lost some of that, you know. People, people grow up, start doing their own thing, and you know, I wasn't immediately all on the internet with, uh, you know, all of my promotion and, you know, really savvy with how to market myself and just, you know, get people's attention for real after that point. Like, you know, because just getting attention on a local level was all I knew at that point. You know, I had songs with few hundred to a thousand plays on 
<laughs> on MySpace Music back when that was popping. And uh, that died the fuck off. And, you know, after that kind of went downhill, I didn't really make my presence on YouTube until I got to college. When I got to college is when I started meeting a lot more people that, you know, were forming a support group around me. By that time, I had proven myself to my older cousin Kay, who goes by Conceited. He had started letting me record over his house, you know, like a couple weekends at a time. Like it started turning into like, you know, a regular thing over the course of like a year or two. And I still kind of sucked. I wasn't, wasn't that good yet. And, um, but I had something. It was enough to see that there was potential there. And, you know, he was one of the people that kind of pushed me to go to college too, because, you know, I was living in Warren at the time and, you know, I was just getting caught up in a lot of things that if I was still caught up in to this day, I probably, you know, who knows, might not be here right now, might be in jail, might, whatever, you know, but so he's like, you know, it's probably a good time for you to go to school. And, you know, I, I still got to thank him for, you know, pushing me to take that step. Uh, because college opened a lot of doors for me and, and showed me the importance of networking through, you know, just meeting the people that I met there. Because before that, I didn't really understand how to approach people and make them care. Like, why should I care? Because, you know, when I was in high school rapping, it was like, especially the environment I was in, it was like everybody wanted me to rap like for them. Like once they knew that it, like everybody who found it entertaining, you know, I was at all the high school parties, bonfires in the backyard, drunk kids running around. And, you know, by the time the first bottle was popped, it was like, yo laws, come freestyle. And then, you know, it, it, it was crazy. But by the time I got into college, it was like, you know, between those last five years or so, six, whatever, it's like everybody and their mother had picked up a fucking microphone. And it was, it was no, I was no longer special. You know what I mean? Because well, I could walk up to somebody and be like, I rap and be like, oh, cool. And then, you know, by that time, it was like, hey, I rap. Yeah, me too. Check out my mixtape. Fuck. Like, you know, like it was like this. It was like a reality check for real. And there was a while where, you know, I almost wanted to quit because, like I said, I've always been somewhat of a rebel against popular culture or just, um, you know, anything that I feel is like bandwagon. And once rap started getting oversaturated by, you know, the number of people who were trying it or, or actually trying to really make a career out of it, uh, it took some of my motivation away for a while. Um, but yeah, once I started going to Kent State, it's within like the first week or two, I met this kid named Deontay from Cincinnati, um, Deontay Brown. And it was like one of the first classes I had. And it was one of those things where the professor was like, yeah, we're going to go around the room. Everybody say your name and say one thing that's interesting about yourself. And he was like, I'm um, Deontay and I make YouTube videos. And my eyes probably lit up like I had fucking dollar signs in them and I didn't say anything to him at that point but you know I was walking through the library later that day and I seen him I was like yo what's up he's like hey aren't you in that class we yeah 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 whatever um you said that you like to make YouTube videos right he's like yeah I'm like oh well well I rap you know let's let's make a music video and he was totally down for it and you know that, that kid showed me a lot of love the majority of the videos that I made were you know, up to this point, like, we're by him. Um, my cousin Kay, you know, we shot one music video together, which was The Rent Cycle, which is still a favorite of mine, a favorite of, you know, some of my core fans. And another person that I met in college was James Drew. Um, and meeting him was like a life-changing experience. You know, me and him started kicking it, and he was showing me some of the things he was doing musically. And, you know, I was just blown away because, you know, dude's not only a good rapper, like he had a production value that nobody else I had met up until that point was getting out of their home studio. Like, you know what I mean? Especially, you know, for him to be like 1920 or something like that. 
And it's just crazy because the more we kicked it, like, I feel like we were just feeding off each other. And um, once he got his own apartment, me, him, this this dude CJ who was producing from Detroit, and you know even Deontay, we would all you know go over to Drew's apartment and just have sessions. And you know either Drew would be recording, I would be recording. We just vibe out, smoke hookah, whatever, just chill, make fucking <laughs> uh, cinnamon swirls in the oven and just fucking kick it like and, and and it was dope because those those guys really you know they they wanted the best for me and they still do so support system those are those are a lot of the people who who stick out um dramatically just when it comes to my music alone not saying those are the only people that support me because i have a lot of supporters um you know like um i gotta give credit to my mom because when i first told my mom i wanted to rap you know, her, her answer was, okay, what's your plan B though? Like, you know, trying to like be cool about it, but be realistic. Like, you know, I probably told her at 14 years old, like, hey, I want to rap for a living. This is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to do. That's, that's cool, son. What's your backup plan? And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I probably turned around within like a year later and was like, hey, mom, guess what? Not only am I gonna rap, I'm gonna make lots of money, buy you a mansion, cars, whatever you want, da 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 da. I'm also going to go to college for graphic design and I'm going to create all my own posters, album covers, banners, flyers, digital media, this and that. And f so that way I'm not getting charged by anybody else to do that stuff. And if rap just happens not to work out, which is gonna work out because I'm, I'm raw. I'll make, you know, I'll make a small fortune off of, you know, my graphic design firm. So recently, and when I say recent, like within the last couple of years, um, my mom blew me away, kind of, just because, you know, as, as a rapper, um, because, you know, just being a rapper has become such a cliche within itself. Um, my mom blew me away in the last couple of years because... Like I said, I was going through this period where I was like, man, everybody's doing this rap thing. I don't, I don't know if I want to do it anymore. Like I still had the, I still had the soul inside that was burning bright for the love of hip hop and the art form and the culture. And I wanted to add to it and, you know, become a part of it, get recognition and change lives and, you know, just have an impact. But like the fact that so many people were rapping and it was, and, and it's not like everybody was doing it, it was just like adding this amazing creative aspect that had never been heard before. It seemed like there were so many clones walking around like everybody wants to sound like Wayne and everybody wants to sound like Drake and everybody, you know what I mean? It just, it, it kind of got whack to me for a while, like, you know, the oversaturation plus the lack of individualism just started to, you know, take some of the inspiration away. Because growing up, I it, it felt like, to me at least, that, you know, every single MC was their own, like, without a doubt. Um, so, you know, I called my mom one night and I was like, you know, mom, I, I, I think I'm going to quit rapping. I think I'm going to, you know, stop doing this. And she told me, son, you can't quit. You've been doing this for how many years now? You've been telling me for how long that this is your, your dream. This is, this is what you want to do with life. She's like, you can't give up now. You have to keep going. And that just... <laughs> It's not something you expect to hear from your mom all the time, you know, not not when she wasn't really on the train like that to begin with. You know what I mean? It's not like she was like, hooray, my son wants to rap. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so those words really hit me. Um, and I don't know if I've thought about quitting since. Um, it really just flows through my veins at this point. And it always has. But now there's no second thought in the back of my head like are you sure you want to do this are you sure this is what you want to waste your time i don't even 
I never feel like that anymore ever since I talked to my mom. So if my, if my mom never supported me in any other moment of my life, which she has, that was some of the deepest shit that she ever said that touched me. And it, you know, it wasn't even that deep. It's not like it was, you know, poetic justice or anything. It was just, you know, her saying that to her one and only son meant, meant a lot to me. And uh, it gave me the fire to keep going. Now, as far as other supporters that I can't leave out, I have to mention one, the A-class homies. All seven of you, okay? Let's, because we're, we're almost at that Wu-Tang 8 right now. So me and Diggs agreed that A-class would be sealed off if we get to eight members. So if there's somebody out there who's trying to get in the group, you might want to hurry up. But yeah, A-class, online founded internet rap group that was started by Diggs the Prophecy from New Jersey and myself. And then later we added Gnostic the Poet, Dill Magnetic, and you know, then it was a four man group. Then after that, we added War and Peace. Then after that, Diggs created this competition on the net called Barfest. First year's winner was a guy who goes by the name of Who the Fuck is Walter, AKA Wally West. And um, this dude, dude has fucking bars. I just said dude, dude. Um, has fucking bars. Became a six man group. And then, our seventh member who just joined in like the last two weeks actually who you know i've been networking with for a while guy does hella shows and performances is lay l-h-y-e and you know the thing about a class that's dope is not only do we talk to each other every day facebook messenger skype calls whatever but you know it's just cool to have people there to constantly bounce your ideas off of to constantly be there for collab requests and and we all have a passion for writing and lyricism. So there's nobody in the group that's like, it's not that we don't hop on trap beats or anything like that, but we really have this undying love for, you know, um, the golden era of hip hop and, and, you know, just what it means to really love this culture and really love the art of emceeing itself. And, you know, that's kind of what the group was founded on and, you know, just more members got attracted by that, that brand that we built and that we're still building. And I cannot mention A-Class without missing Okinawa Resonance, uh, OR, which was founded by Troy L out of Columbus, Ohio. You know, him, Just X, and a lot of the other OR homies uh, just took off over like the last, you know, year or two. These guys are booming on SoundCloud and all over the internet and just, you know, are doing a lot for beats as far as, you know, anime samples and video game samples. Uh, these guys are killing it. There's been waves of producers coming to this, you know, online network and community of people that I, that I rock with. We show a lot of love to each other, but these guys popped up and it was just kind of like they came out of nowhere. And, you know, Troy L hit Diggs and myself up one day and was like, you know, do you guys, would you guys like to be affiliated with OR? And we're like, yeah, of course. You guys are consistent, do things style-wise that match with who we are as a group. It's an instant connection there. And those guys are always supporting new music, supporting our new music when we put it out. You know, always dropping comments, always sharing leaks, always hopping in Skype calls. And, you know, it's really just like a big family between the two of us. It's pretty dope. So, yeah, I don't want anybody else to feel left out. Love all my fans, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, even though I'm not on IG that much anymore because I just started seeing too much stuff that was getting me in trouble with my girlfriend. And, um, but yeah. Thank all you guys, um, because the, the love has been real. Almost at 2K on SoundCloud followers, and yeah, it just feels good to have all you guys actually give a fuck about what I'm doing. Like, thank you. This is my boy GK. He inspired me to be out here getting his music out, handing it out to people like you should be doing if you got a dream. Chasing it. Out here getting it. Watch. Somebody else gonna pull up and he gonna hand, hand them his music. Because everybody needs to hear your shit. That's how it should be all the time. Appreciate it, yo. I got your shit in the car right now, bro. Appreciate it, yo. With all ups and downs, good and bad, you're ripping it up to say you love me even when I make you mad. And you can get the pussy on the man, don't gotta ask. You love it when I take it from your special.
My dad didn't really have a lot of like passionate things that he passed on to me. Like, you know what I mean? Like he tried to teach me how to fish and stuff and you know, baseball, but like I didn't really pick up either of those things like even now, like, I need to relearn how to, like, line a fishing lure. Like, I need to relearn it, like. Yeah. But, you know, he also didn't, he didn't pass dreams to me. He just passed down pastimes, you know what I mean? Like, like I want to make sure that I give my kids, like, my, my passion and my dreams, like, so they, you know, they know it's okay to dream themselves. Like, they know they're dead. Like, regardless of where I am, when they get old enough for me to really share it with them, I still will. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, that's my shit. Up ones over the years. If you watch it out a day, you die tonight. I'm missing that because it's right here in real life. Where are we going? Alright, so right now we're headed to Warren, Ohio. Um, we're gonna go to the Warren Murderville. Um, we're gonna get some food. Um, we're gonna get some food. 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 We're gonna get some the reason we're headed to Dubtown right now is, well, Dubtown's connected to Niles, which is where my grandmother and my mother currently stay at. And I need to go see them. So while we're in the area, hopefully uh, some of my old homies will be out and, you know, might go pay my pops a visit and, you know. But yeah, Warren uh, had an impact on my life that made me become the person that I am today. I originally moved there um, out of two aspirations. One, I was only working my first job straight out of high school, which was at Mark's, which is a grocery store. And I was a stock boy making minimum wage. Um, There's a call center in uh, Warren and I was going to work there and, you know, make, you know, some decent money but I moved out there and I ended up not staying for like more than like a week for real. Like, and so, but I had already moved. So now basically, you know, in the timeline itself, I'm stuck in Warren, Ohio. Um, Warren, Ohio used to have like a huge, like, you know, steel industry. Uh, Levi Steel is a big uh, factory that used to be in Warren, Ohio. And you know, a lot of the surrounding plants used to pull in a lot of money. Well, basically when all that shut down, you know, it did a lot of damage to the city's economy. So uh, when, when I was in Warren, I really learned what the true meaning of struggle was. I was homeless at times in Warren, even though I always had a roof over my head. I know, knew too many people that, you know, sleep in the streets or anything like that. But um, there were times when I didn't have food or didn't have, you know, uh, the amount of food that I like to eat and you know I just it just taught me to be grateful for what I had also while I was in Warren is uh, when I got some time to catch up with my father um, my parents got divorced when I was 13 years old my dad had moved uh, back to Warren eventually and you know Warren is where a lot of his family's at so it was only right for him to go you know back to the city that you know a lot of his family members were in. Uh, his mother was there at the time, rest in peace. His sister, Gail, who we may or may not see. And you know, some other people that, you know, he, he was just close to. So, uh, while I was there, I was there because, um, you know, besides the job itself, my mother's sister, my aunt, my aunt Pat, uh, her best friend, and her used to work at this place called Rebecca Williams. So when I was in school, eventually my mother put me in Rebecca Williams summer camp so I could be around other black kids because I grew up in a predominantly white school. I didn't know anything what it was like to be around, you know, people who looked like me. And so my mom thought that was important, you know, in my youth for me to experience being around other black kids, other black children. And, um, you know, that's where I met one of my best friends to this date, damn near my brother. You know, the only thing that separates us is blood, but what the fuck is blood? My homie Armani. And, uh, 
Armani probably won't be out here today. He lives in Columbus now, but you know, he comes back to visit his peoples pretty often too. So that's my best friend. When I moved out to Warren for real, for real, uh, it was like a dream come true because we had got to kick it like we always wanted to. Before that, you know, it was just us getting together every now and then on the, during the summer. Um, but when I moved out to Warren, we kicked it every day, man. We did whatever. You know, we were out in the streets, just running around, chasing girls, buying clothes, going to the club, you know what I mean? Partying, smoking, drinking, whatever, you know what I mean? Having the time of my life. It's me, him, and a couple other homies. Me, him, Tate, D May, Mike May, RIP. And then, you know, his older brothers. But when I got to know them, when I met them for the first time, which was, uh, but you know what, I'll I, I save the rest of that for when we get there. We can drive around to some of the spots and I'll, I'll give you my little introduction of how I actually uh, came to know the city of Warren. Dubtown, upside down. 330 Murderville. Hey. I got a beat. Start it over. Yeah, start it over. Start over. Hey, hey, hey. What think about me and my niggas? We don't fuck with them undercover hating ass, snitch ass niggas. But you can bet your ass and your money. You fuck with the bitch. This is where everybody in Warren pretty much comes to shop. You got the mall over here, and then over there you got, you know, the plaza with Toys R Us. Um, I never really went to that movie theater, but me and my homies sometimes would go up to B-Dubs, Buffalo Wild Wings. My homie Zach from high school um, actually just moved out here not too long ago, and you know, every time we get together, we usually go to that B-Dubs right there. Um, I've shopped at that Save a Lot before, that TJ Maxx, all of that shit. Don't really get shoes from Shoe Carnival. I don't know if anybody does. Um, but yeah, this mall behind you, they just build all this extra shit on here. But my parents have been bringing me to the rest of this mall since I was a little boy, for real. Uh, so this is the Eastwood Mall. We used to go in through JCPenney over there all the time. Uh, there's another entrance in the front. Um, and there used to be what's called a KB Toys in that mall. KB Toys doesn't exist anymore, but uh, my dad used to bring me to the mall and I would always beg for new shit at KB Toys. Every time we would come, KB Toys was dope. Had all the newest action figures, fucking Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Pokemon cards, all that shit. Uh, I was heavy into Beyblade at one point. Every time we came out here, I had to get a new Beyblade spinning top. Was letting that shit rip. 
And then, you know, I was just always out here. This is the place to kick it, man. Fucking Eastwood Mall. This is the shit. So, yeah, right now we're in Niles, Ohio. And, you know, this is the Eastwood Mall. This is uh, where I spent a lot of my childhood coming to shop and shit. Hometown Buffet is over there. Um, which used to be the shit, but last time I went there, the food was dry as hell. And then uh, you can't see it because the Hampton Inn Suites is right there. But behind the Hampton Inn, Hampton Inn Suites is the movie theater that I saw a lot of my first movies at. Um, Regal Cinema. Yeah, it's right over there. My mom used to always bring me there. Saw a few shits there. I'm trying to think what I might have seen there kind of hard to remember now um damn i can't remember what i've seen there i've seen a lot of movies there though i've seen a lot of movies over there so yeah this area is significant to me because you know a lot of a lot of my memories still exist and float around in this place being straight towards the mall i'm right there yeah yeah I mean, I'm by the Dillard sign in the back of the mall, but I'm actually in not the main JC. It, it's like the parking lot that's in the mid, uh, that's between everything. It's between Toys R Us, JC Penney's, Dillard's, and the Hampton Inn Suite. I'm like right in the middle of all of that. But as soon as you drive back here, you'll literally see us outside. Or I can, I mean, I can just hop in back in the car and ride up front. Oh, good. What you got for? Me? Too I'm not holding the bag. <laughs> oh, this shit's dope. Hell yeah. Bam! These ain't out yet. I got the first one. Dub City, Dub Town, Upside Down. You're gonna see me rocking this bitch all the time, everywhere. Get yours. Now! <laughs> Hell yeah. And throw this shit on over what I got over here. <laughs> Woo! Ooh, it's official. Crisp. crisp. This is the only time you're going to see me throw this shit up. Everybody else be, I think this is like some Illuminati shit. When you see me throw this up, this means 330, okay? I don't know what the fuck y'all niggas be throwing up. This is 330 when you see me throw this shit up. Don't be in my inbox asking me if I joined the Illuminati. I did not. This is 330, okay? That's obvious, right? If you look at my hands, did you pass third grade, nigga? You can count, right? And you understand basic geometry, right? This is a zero. One, two, three, 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 oh, all right? Don't be hitting me up asking me if I'm with Donald Trump's campaign and all this other shit. That's not what's going on. Blow. <laughs> and then uh, I. Bam. Yeah, so that's cool. I was pretty excited. This is my cousin Kay. This is like one of the first people to record me, even though I had to beg him to record me for like two years before he would take me serious. Because I sucked, rightfully, flow-wise and delivery and shit. My lyrics was always nice. I'm gonna keep saying that shit. Was my lyrics always nice? Lyrics was always nice. Lyrics content. was always nice, yeah. always had content. I was always talking about some shit. But you suck ass niggas out there just literally saying the same shit you just heard somebody else say because you think it's gonna make you popular, you think it's gonna make you sell. That shit's whack. We don't do that around here. We actually talk about our life. Anyway, this is Kay, AKA Conceited. Who had the name before the battle rap, nigga? Mind you. Um, I used to stay at Kay's place for like two summers, wake him up at like nine o'clock in the morning recording and screaming on his mic. He'd come downstairs and cuss me out because he had to work. Um, so the rule was no recording until 10 a.m. Yeah. But uh, I basically slept in the studio. So you best believe when 10 a.m. hit, I was in that motherfucking booth every day. Nothing right the bass thumping through my bedroom. He lived like right above the <laughs> studio, which you know. That's not my fault. I didn't construct the house, but <laughs> I was in that booth every day for two summers straight. If you go on my band camp, 
that's where you're going to see Stuck in Day 6, Return to Sky High, and even my uh, last mixtape, They Don't Know to Have, all of that was recorded right at this man's house right here. So that's who K is. K gave me my first Nas CD, Illmatic. That's how I learned to structure bars the right way and when I finally started getting some flow for real. So this is how this man is significant to my life besides just being my blood. So know what the fuck is up. Uh, Woods Productions, Dub City, you know what it is. LA, we out. So right now we at the pit stop. This is like, well to me, the most notorious drive through in Dub City for real. We used to get all our blunt wraps here back when I was smoking strong, you know what I mean? Hey, can I get an Arizona tropical blend? Back when I first started coming here, Black and Mild had just came out with their own blunt wraps. So we was rolling them heavy after, uh, after we stopped fucking with Swisher Sweets because uh, they just don't stick very well when you roll them. But uh, the Black and Miles roll like a fucking charm, man. You know, the paper's really thick though. So, you know, after smoking them for like a year or so, we decided that that shit's probably not real good for you. Yeah, that's good. Is there, is there a purple one? Is there one with purple checkers on it? The pink one. That one. And so, uh, yeah. And then, um, you know, after I stopped fucking with Black and Mild Blunt Raps, uh, I started fucking with those White Owls. Yes, sir. And uh, White Owls are still my favorite. If I'm going to smoke, I'm going to smoke White Owls. Thanks. So yeah, this is the pit stop. Then over here, this building right here, this is Artistics. It used to be next door over here, but they just moved over there. Artistics, um, I actually used to work with the owner, and when I started my uh, t-shirt line, which uh, is called Ace Apparel, which is coming back early next year, um, Tim Drummond, who owns Ace Apparel, or not Ace Apparel. Tim Drummond, who owns Artistic, was uh, helping me out. He was hooking me up and he was helping me get my line started. And uh, I was peddling a lot of my designs out here to just, you know, anybody else come across in the streets, some of my local homies around here. And, you know, just making, y'all you know, $15 here, $20 there, just selling my t-shirts. I used to, uh, you know, stay at my dad's house down the street from here. And, you know, I wake up early in the morning, go walk around the neighborhood, come back, do some sketches, outline them in ink, and then, you know, bring them down to Tim's shop. Tim would throw them in his computer, I'd, you know, throw him some cash, and then I'd, I'd come out, you know, and come up with some, some dope-ass t-shirts and just, you know, sell them to whoever would like my designs. And that's when, you know, I first started learning how to hustle for real, like, you know, sell my ideas and my creativity to people. And, it was just a valuable experience to have. This up here, see this is history, man. This is for real. I have so much history in this town. Um, a lot of my, some of my family still lives here or just in the area at least. This is where, you know, me and Armani met each other for the first time. Um, Armani's mom and my aunt were best friends. So that's how we met each other. And then, you know, we go in to meet Lil Shady and the rest of the 330 Murderville clique right now. And uh, Shady is Armani's older brother. So that's how we made that connection. So it all started in that building. And uh, Rebecca Williams was cool, man. There was a lot of people, you know, whose names still ring, bell in the, ring bells in this city that were there. Um, you know, there was... Uh, there's a bunch of people who just, you know, touch people in Rebecca Williams. Um, you know, rather it was, uh, damn, I always draw a blank when I'm trying to think of names for real. David Jenkins, coach, coach, coach. But yeah, anyway, right now, we about to pull up on First Street, meet up with the 330 homies, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah
My nigga both, you feel me? 330. Upside down murder wheel. LA Dub Z. That's on your album? Hell no, your shit wouldn't be on my album. Right. <laughs> the very last one. I was like, hell no. And that's how we do it. 3.30. Uh, I guess we should get on this side since so she got more. Ball of holler. Come on in, in the, shit, we could be for me. Somebody man. sitting on the, in, in, in the. Brand new cat, man. Shit. <laughs> Check out the white wall. <laughs> get the white wall uh -oh. on the caddy. Make sure you get the mustard and mayonnaise. <laughs> they got my key. Mustard and mayonnaise. Yeah, they no, got my key. Just come on, take a pick. Paint we'll trick pick by the motherfucking caddy. Okay, well, it's shit. It's real man. candy. You can taste this shit. <laughs> real candy. You can taste this shit, baby. <laughs> Dark in here. No shit, nigga. Where you? Harvard. Truth is that I don't have the time for this shit. Why do you look so evil when you get your picture taken? Because I'm a villain rubbing my cat. When she took everybody out, no, we were not supposed to be wearing it. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Yeah, duck, duck for one. Several thousand fighters in Mosul. They've been digging underground. They've been prepared to defend. Oh yeah, one. It's going to be tough fighting. I was so shocked that you were writing lyrics because, because what's he's ADD, you know, and he didn't ever be still for more than two seconds. Though. And the fact that he could sit and down and, say, and you know, oh, write so lyrics and not move was she astonishing. Just, just yeah. So, you know, I was just shocked about that. So I really don't remember my reaction when he told me they were going to put a band together. I guess like anybody else, I'll be you know. But he did, and, and, and they did a good job. And I went to a lot of the concerts that were local, and he played at some pretty impressive places for just getting started. But he doesn't tell me about his music now because he doesn't want me to hear the naughty words. <laughs> What about arts and crafts, Mom? We used to do arts and crafts together. Oh, yeah. He'd get up at 10 o'clock at night and come downstairs and say, can we do a craft now? It was like on a school night. He's supposed to be asleep, and he's crawling out of bed talking about, let's do a craft. So he should be very talented because he's been playing with everything I've gotten. And if you look around this apartment, you'll see, like, tons of drawers of... You name us in here. <laughs> That's sweet. Were a lot of the crafts like drawing, or you guys like actually like make stuff? Or well, back then, make stuff. He draws, you know, on his own now. Cause I was just kind of okie dokie at that. But he's he's very good at the drawing. But you know, we made things out of clay and paper and cardboard. And, as you see, I'm playing with cardboard now, so I haven't stopped. I like the fact that everybody is upcycling now. Yeah. You know, so I, I try to do a lot of that, and uh, my nephew and I have our own little business, and you know, like I try to keep the, do a lot with the packaging, redoing, you know, reusing stuff for packaging and all that. Um, I was a seamstress by career, so. He used to come in when I was sewing and sit on top of my pedal and crawl all over my material when I was on the floor and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, he started at an early age seeing me do all that kind of stuff and it just kind of sprung from that. But I, I dabble in all of it that I can get my hands on, you know. Yeah. I make a little bit of jewelry. I make, I mostly like making things for kids, though. That's my favorite thing. Nice. So. Any kind of like bracelets or necklaces or just kind of pieces of work and. 
Well, I do my, uh, macrame. Okay. Which, you know, was like really popular when I was you guys' age. Yeah. And it's coming back now. So I, I do a lot of uh, ID bracelets and macrame mm -hmm. and um, some beading. And I make a lot of soft things like uh, I like making pillows and uh, I make a lot of little animals and food, felt food by, you know, by hand. Yeah. I love sewing by hand. It's very relaxing. Yeah. Yes, this was probably the first piece of food I made by and I felt like <laughs> and my mother decided to keep it to remind me of what I did. So now the grandchildren think it's theirs to play with. That's so cool. So yeah, I make, you know, a lot of uh, 18 inch doll clothes. Back in the day when arthritis had the patent set in, I did a lot of weddings. Mm -hmm. I, I started out, well not really started out, but my first real career job was working for SeaWorld doing costumes. And nice. everything just kind of sprang out of that, I guess. <laughs> what yeah. I wasn't already doing, but you know, the sewing part. That's so awesome. I've been sewing like for other people besides myself since I was probably 12. I was very young. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm 60, just turned 63 Monday, so. Happy late birthday. I know Lawrence is telling me that the, I yeah. see the party streamers. Yeah, and I, I'm slowly and moving all that stuff into my room, which everybody told me to throw it away. But I like Hello Kitty. I don't care how old I am. So <laughs> I have a corner that's Hello Kitty in my bedroom. Yeah, one of my best friends is obsessed with it. They had like a backpack in high school and it was all Hello Kitty. Their pencils were, their notebooks were, like it was everything. Yeah, it, they just finally, I guess, started making stuff like that so it fit people like me. You know, because it really was, I guess, I guess it was made with kids in mind. But if you look at the, like the Comic-Con, mm -hmm. they have one just for her now. Oh, nice. And it was in L.A. and it was like there were more grown-ups there than there were kids. That's cool. And they had everything, including like Hello Kitty fashion, I mean like high couture fashion. Yeah. You know? It had anything to think of. For yeah, her. for like adults, it's not just yeah. the kids. Yeah, they I kind of pushed the poor chick kids out of the way and took over <laughs> as usual. It's like we've done with Halloween and everything else. You know, the adults eventually have kind of pushed the kids out of the way and make it their own. Because adults didn't used to celebrate Halloween. You know, and now they right. go to the parties and they dress up and poor kids are sitting home with their little piece of candy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What, was, what were some um, music artists like that you grew up listening to like who well, you some... know i grew up like in the air with like the supremes and the temptations and the beatles and i remember when they actually the first concert they did that's you know yeah my generation and i had one of them bobble it looked like a bobblehead but it really did and a paul because that's how paul was really handsome back then and, yeah mm -hmm. we didn't go to concerts as kids so that was a that was a no-no so i didn't get to do the things like you know kids do now they start yeah now they're years so old, you know. available to get a concert yeah. tickets and there's so many venues around and our parents didn't, you know you had to be in your late teens before you started getting to do things like that so i missed out on a lot of that but um we tried to imitate them we tried to dance like them mm -hmm. <laughs> i had a dress you know and we i did diana ross in the you know the talent show at school and, um yeah it was mostly a lot of r b for us and, and then we were born in cleveland moved out to the country yeah. and so i got exposed to you know all kinds of different music then because I don't think I even knew what country music was when I lived in the city you know but once we moved out there you know everybody else listened to different kinds of music so we got to hear it and get used to it and I like a lot of rock now which I probably wouldn't have if I had stayed in the city I wouldn't have been as yeah. exposed to it but I like a lot of I don't like the real coming to get you and, you know like Metallica and that kind of stuff the yeah. acid rock but you know like Rolling Stones and things like that I really like that kind of music yeah that's what my favorite kind of like ACDC and Journey and Def Leppard and I've been and, to some of those concerts too even though you'd look at me and think not but you know I've been to a few of those kind of concerts. And what were a few or if you were a few bands that you got to see live? Uh, you know, the, the the most exciting I think person I've ever seen live was Elton John. No way. That I was like four rows up from this from the stage. 
yeah. you know, and he, he was still wearing the big heeled shoes that had live goldfish floating in the heels and the eyeglasses that spilled his name across his face and, and blinked on and all, it was just fabulous. That's awesome. Uh, everything that was, he threw, uh, the drummer threw his sticks, you know, into the Ooh. audience for people to catch it. And that was probably, out of all the concerts I've been to in my life, that was probably the, the most exciting and the biggest because it was just, it was, you know, people were just jammed. What venue was it at? It doesn't even exist anymore. Oh, it's out where, it's, it's actually out where he works. It's what's called the Coliseum. It was out, it was out in Ridgefield. Oh, yeah, no, my dad said he actually saw the Iron Maiden at that. At that venue. Yeah, I think I saw uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire there, and they actually had a, a spaceship up in the sky that came down, and they all came out dressed in those silver suits and things. Yeah. That was, that was pretty cool, too, actually. Um, That's sweet. I know it's cool. It's crazy because I feel like concerts are some of the most vivid memories that I have. And it's crazy because your generation is enjoying that same music that my generation made. So you Yeah, know, I have a Beatles Abbey Road record yeah. at, at home, and my parents gave me a lot of their vinyls. Yeah, I would I would say if I could still dig through I have forty fives with Beatles on it. Nice. You know? okay. Yeah. And it's kinda of coming back now, which is pretty cool. That a lot of people actually per, vinyl again. Per, per the vinyl. It's yeah. funny because you it 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 gets scratchy after a while and stuff. But I guess yeah. that, that shows you how much it's been loved. Right, mm -hmm. right. And you play it, it kinda of fills the room. It has a I guess it has a yeah, just a different kind of atmosphere or a sound to it when you play it on vinyl. I like it a lot. I'm glad my parents gave me their, they kept all their old music for me to listen to. Cause... We even have, now this was my parents' music, I have glass yeah. records that were, um, what was it, 76, 70, 70 something, other. but they're yeah. about, not quite as big as an album, you know, oh, but yeah, yeah, they yeah. break if, if they shatter. They're mm -hmm. like a Corel dish almost, you know. And my parents had those. I've got a lot of like old blues ones and a lot of gospel music that's on. And it's only one song on that great big disc. Yeah. You know? And you can hear it as it's moving around. That you know. It, this is the family here. Come on over here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there he is. And then that's the next generation because that's his son. That's awesome. But this, except for these, this is me and my sister being silly with the big glasses on, but all the rest of grandchild, great grandchild, great grandchild, great grandchild, grandchild, great grand, great grand. Oh <laughs> my crap. Well, I have to show him this. He didn't get to see this. Make a message to my sister. She said she couldn't find one in the store, so I thought I'd make her one. <laughs> Bite, huh? <laughs> That's where I got my hands from. <laughs> Hang it open. No, I'll let this thing close. Okay. Yeah, I'll be careful. Call me in a couple days and I'll let you know. Okay, I will. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. If you love it, do it. Don't be persuaded by anybody else. And find your torch and carry that motherfucker. Like, hold it up high and don't be scared because people will criticize you. People will tell you to stop. People will tell you you won't make it. And here's the funny thing about making it. This whole, like, making it. I hear people say, like, I just want to make it. You know what I mean? And, and I, I want to say something real quick because, you know, um, this whole idea of making it uh, almost deferred me. Let me stop with the air quotes. Almost like killed my dream entirely because um, at, when I was younger and falling in love with rap, um, it was like watching, you know, rappers on MTV and BT and, you know, on, you know, blowing up on YouTube and, you know, signing these million dollar contracts and going on these worldwide tours and 
making it became like this thing that was set in cement. And if I wasn't doing that exact thing, I wasn't making it. And to be honest, at this point, I, I made it already. I made it already because music has brought me, you know, a place of peace inside. And I've already seen, you know, hundreds of people come up to me, whether it's in person, slide in my inbox on the internet and just say, thank you for making music. Keep making it. This song changed my life made my day better like stuff like that has happened to me and I don't think it's fair for me to sit here and say I didn't make it until I'm making a million dollars cash money off of the records that I make I think that's bullshit and I think that it's you know it's it's a it's a terrible mind frame to have it's not terrible to make million dollars cash money don't get me wrong I'm just saying that that shouldn't be the thing that defines what making it in your music and making it in music, if anything, if there's even a definition for that, should be just getting to a certain point in your actual creative process. You should be able to make it in music without your music even ever coming out, depending who you are. You should be able to be a fucking hermit, sit in your room for five years straight until you, you know, make the Mona Lisa of records and like, yo... I made it. This is what I've been working on to make this masterpiece. Like, and then if it's really that beautiful, if it has that type of impact on you and brings you that type of self-fulfillment, somebody else is going to hear that and they're going to feel the same way. It's going to do the same thing for them, if not even more. So that's what you should aim for. You know what I mean? All the money and you know, attention from people and recognition and, and the groupies and, you know, whatever else and big houses and whatever you think you're going to get out of this thing should all be secondary to the music itself. So that's what I want the younger generation to know. Fall in love with the music, fall in love with the creative process, fall in love with connecting with your fans and finding people who relate to what you're creating and everything else should come along with it as long as you have hard work ethic and determination and you believe in yourself. You actually believe, you know what I mean? Like, I've studied so many different rappers and I've became so versatile. You know, there was a time where I was like, if I become this talented, I'll make it. And, you know, now I realize that one, the actual talent itself as far as you know my writing process and things like that don't mean what they used to mean to the culture especially when it comes to record sales and things like that and you know A&Rs and labels and getting signed and stuff doesn't work the same way it was working in the 90s and you know it's not the same thing anymore independent is the new sexy as my man E40 40 water said in this interview that I saw with uh, DJ Ski and I think he's absolutely correct um, you know there was a time where I wanted to be signed, but that went away because I realized that, you know, I don't want somebody else, especially nowadays, for you to get signed nowadays, you know, to a decent contract at all, if there's such a thing, um, it almost seems like you have to do all the groundwork yourself. You have to build that, you know, million person fan base. You have to get that internet following, that, you know, that social media following, that you have to go out, bust your ass, and do all these shows, and pay for some piece of shit van, and tour the country, and do whatever the fuck you want to do, you know, and this isn't just for rappers, you know, if you're in a band or whatever. I feel like if you work that damn hard to, cre to create something, why the hell am I about to sign it off on a piece of paper to somebody else who probably doesn't even give a fuck about it like that? You know what I mean? Like, they see the money and they see the, you know, the net worth and, you know, how it could be good for business and, you know, how it could be good for oh, all these endorsements and all these other things that are going to come out of it. And, you know, fuck all that, man. If, if, if you don't want me now, then you fucking lost, okay? Because by the time I, you know, my fan base is strong enough that, you know, I can show up in a city eight hours away from me and 
a thousand plus people are going to show up just to see me. You know, anybody who wants me to sign a contract can kiss my ass because you weren't there for this. You weren't there for these years I'm putting in right now. You know what I mean? Years. I'm 26 right now. Started writing again when I was 12. You know, so I've been doing this, you know, just the art form itself for over 10 years. And, you know, maybe I haven't been able to pour uh, X amount of money into, you know, the career itself. Um, but I've put time into the art. I've put time into my craft. I've put time into promoting. I've done, you know, an abundance of shows. You know, I've, I've done live performances. I've, you know, I've got out there and I've rapped for anybody who's wanted me to rap. You know, I've printed out business cards and passed them around to people. And I've, you know, had hard copies of my mixtapes and, you know, had returned to sky high, you know, a cardboard box full of CDs, you know, outside of, the Kendrick Lamar show at Kent State just waiting to pass them out to people as soon as they came out of the concert just to, you know, get a little bit more of a local buzz. I have did a lot of things and I'm still not anywhere close to what a lot of people would consider making it. But is that stopping me? Do I feel bad about myself? Absolutely not, man. Thank you guys for who, who are, you know, in the know of who I am and actually fucking with what I do you know, and showing me love for it because you keep me going. I am the label. We are the label. We are the brand. You know what I mean? And, you know, when I when I start rolling out these LA Dub Z t-shirts very soon, um, and, you know, I get more merch going again, and, you know, I start printing out hard copies again, it's just another example, you know? It's just another piece of the groundwork, the foundation. Build that yourself. It's more self-fulfilling at the end. I kind of got locked into this like routine of releasing like, you know, at least like a track every couple of weeks. Even though a track isn't that much, I didn't realize how busy that was keeping me. Especially right now, it's like I hit these uh, areas in my timeline, these periods that become designated for certain things. And right now, I'm definitely in a creation period. I'm like literally at least starting a new song every day, if not, you know, coming close to completion. After I feel like that is past, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, over the last year or two or three or four, um, I've gone through a lot of life-changing life experiences and um, my own evolution as a person has inspired me so much on the writing side that I just have to keep creating right now because I have a lot that I want to say about this time period in my life. And when I feel like I've gotten a lot of that out, you know, then I'll move on to something else like, you know, just dropped my first music video in like two years, in like a good two years. And that felt so good. Um, because to be honest, like there's so many different veins of music and marketing and your fan base and, you know, promotion and just the overall musical creative experience itself. Like there's so many different veins and avenues of it that, you know, you can only drive down one or two of those at a time, you know, without losing, you know, some time over here. So it's just like, eventually when I feel like I've expressed enough of what I want to say about my life right now, I'll be focusing more on, you know, the videos, which the videos are, you know, coming right now. Like, you know, I'm kind of shifting gears right now, almost. Um, but... You know, like I said, my merch is coming. Um, I'm, you know, finally making some decent money outside of my music where, you know, um, the people who want to support me deserve um, some some decent merch and some, you know, it's time for some new hard copies of some music to come out and, you know, I'll be mailing shit to people who, you know, actually want it. And, you know, they deserve that. You guys deserve that. And, you know, there's almost a part of me that, that feels bad that, you know, 
I'm almost being selfish in a way by just caring so much about creating the music itself without, you know, I haven't done a, a, a live performance in a while now. It's been since last summer. It's been a year since I've done a legit show um, where I promote it for, you know, a couple weeks at a time and have people come out and see me fucking rip shit. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, it's like a, a certain part of me dies when I go too long without doing anything. If I go too long without making a song, there's a part of me that feels lightweight disturbed or depressed about that. If I go too long without performing, you know, if I go too long without making a video, because these are all things that, you know, create this dynamic that I have going on as an artist and, you know, just, just this character in the existence of our realm. So, um, and I don't want to give up on any of it, you know. Um, something I always fought my mom about is, boy, you can't do everything at once. And I was like, yes, I can. Yeah, I can. And, you know, there was a time where I got away with it. But as I get older, I, you know, I lied to you not. I shit you not, the shit is getting harder um, to, to juggle all these different things. And, you know, that's just music, you know, not to mention, you know, the shit that's going on in my life outside of making music. So to juggle that and then juggle these things and, you know, I'm and I'm not that great of a juggler, like I actually, you know, juggling for real, not, not that good. So but metaphorically, you know, not bad, but um, I probably should focus on prioritizing just a little bit more. Um, inside of music because, you know, I love creating so much, I can't stop. It's an addiction. I got my own house and shit, and me and my girl live here right now, and it's different, you know, than actually having a member of my team who was dedicated to the music process itself, you know, being there with me and walking with me every day. Um, you know, Kay had his own team of musicians. Um, Beast from the Woods uh, out of Warren, Ohio. And, you know, those guys were basically who frequented that booth before I ever really got to, you know, shine inside of our little family and uh, start going in there and, you know, showing what I had. But, you know, those guys um, were an inspiration to me at the time because, you know, they were doing it before I was doing it. So, um, and, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to shine as hard as them or outshine them. Just in our little clique, you know, not on like a, you know, not even on a local level. I just wanted to be, and, and that's another thing, like having a rap camp, like, you know, um, just having a few other MCs around to spar with um, is important. Keeps you sharp on your toes, keeps you, you know, you're always going to look at the things that they got going for them. Uh, talent wise and you know that they're just creatively dope at be like hmm where do they have me beat at and that's going to inspire you to you know be better in certain areas and come back and kick their ass on the next track and um, you know I don't even remember what the fucking question was at this point I really don't but I'm I'm just you know telling you what the fuck I feel like needs to be said it's your boy LA Dub Z and thank you for watching my first exclusive interview with Abby Cap videos she's fucking dope check out her channel check out my channel Ohio forever it's the old bitch you know I rep this shit Buckeye State A class company you know what it is O R I C U Woods Productions Vet Biz all that shit you know it's good LA <laughs>